and that is that we believe there are such values in some places that we really would like to share it. And the here and now, you visit parks, you visit wonderful places, and you get enjoyment. You take family, you take friends, if you have visitors from overseas, you will take them to such places because you share a belief and an experience that they're worth visiting and worth enjoying. And the concept of a trust is that that experience, that benefit, that emotional response you have some such, from such places, you wish to, to share with others that will follow you. Not only your children, not only your grandchildren, but future generations. And that is known in environmental law and sustainability terms as what's called the intergenerational equity. Now, if I may say, that's, that's the, uh, the more serious, reflective side. But, but it's often people ask, why do you do it? Well, why do you stay in a national trust organization for as long as I have? And it's because on a daily basis, I see people uplifted by the experience. Their lives are improved. They get enjoyment and fulfillment. To see people doing that is a very rewarding part of life that anyone should welcome. But we're not alone in this country. And what I want to demonstrate to you all um, is that there is, in fact, a worldwide move to do. Uh -huh.
to come to us and we would learn from their experience and they would learn from our experience. So a total exchange of knowledge, know-how, how to do it better, look after the patients. So, and as I said before, this intergenerational equity aspect is at the heart and soul of heritage conservation. Uh, a selfless attitude of looking after the best today for those that follow us. So we launched a new, new Delhi. We had both the Indian Prime Minister and the Vice President, half the Indian Cabinet, and many hundreds of people present. And we brought together people from in that just on 80 countries, and we uh, uh, formed an organisation which has a board of 14, 14 nations, and the diversity is extraordinary. And it's my delight every month to chair this board from 14 nations, just about 10 different languages, and what they're doing is inspiring the youth of their countries, encouraging governments to make uh, better decisions, and effectively ensuring that the things that we cherish today can go forward. Very early on, we secured the strong support of Prince Charles, and he uh, came to us and said, look, I have been patron of the National Trust in England for many years, and uh, I hold very dearly the concept of heritage conservation. And if I, I embark upon a royal official tour, I would like to take an inter-representative if there is some prospect of establishing a new national trust. So when he visited uh, Hungary two years ago, uh, we accompanied uh, him, and today there is a Hungarian national trust. And he's convened workshops for us, uh, he's encouraged us to uh, go into places where there haven't been trust before and explain what the potential is. So let me just give you some insight on the diversity of the National Trust movement. Uh, in uh, Canada, uh, there are nature conservancies, heritage conservancies in just about every province. This wonderful organisation of that conservancy in British uh, Columbia is very much like the Australian Trust. Natural areas and cultural areas uh, are their responsibilities. Uh, in the Gelderland, which is one of the uh, provinces in uh, the Netherlands, we're from the Gold. Well, it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, they are actually one of the largest trusts in the world. They have the most wonderful portfolio of magnificent properties, largely uh, prestigious mansions, castles, and palaces in wonderful gardens. Some trusts, however, uh, have very much a different attitude of the, the humble, uh, the humble building the traditional way of traditional people, such as the Fijian National Trust, which is very much a national trust that is concerned about the natural environment and the interrelationship of humankind with uh, sustainable environmental management. Uh, Slovakia. Slovakia is a, uh, a very strong but very small national trust. Uh, we recently funded the establishment of a best practice facility in Bratislava, the capital, in one of the oldest buildings. By establishing that facility in Bratislava, we will, on the one hand, restore one of the oldest buildings, and the other will provide a, a means by which uh, people throughout Slovakia can gain knowledge, insight as to how to look after their uh, places that they're responsible for. In Shanghai, uh, we have the Rural Wishwan Foundation, which is one of the two Chinese national trusts. Uh, they have a huge challenge in China, as you might imagine, but there is absolutely no doubt that there is great enthusiasm for the cause. I've visited China uh, three times now and over the last few years, and it's been extraordinarily encouraging to see what effort they were putting in the area of conservation. I'm looking through uh, the Indonesian Heritage Trust is an interesting one. There are, there are 18 in Indonesia, 18 national trusts. They have properties, but one of the critical issues that uh, they want to see is the maintenance of intangible heritage. Song, dance, storyline, artwork, 
which is as much a part of the heritage of all nations as uh, it is for them. And so uh, they've been uh, very keen uh, to be part of the global family. In Africa, likewise, uh, there are, uh, we now have uh, 10 members across the African continent, and they are largely also based on uh, the maintenance of cultural traditions, expressions of culture through their art, song and dance. But Africa is a place of great tension, and let me just stop at this stage and, and indicate uh, some of the problems that occur. It seems to be the case that if you look at the history of warfare and aggression across humankind, that one of the most effective ways of defeating your enemy is to drive a, a stake into the very heart of your opponent, and that is often to destroy the cultural place or item of greatest care and concern to them. And wars are characterized by people trying to annihilate people, but to obliterate their cultural traditions. And, uh, and uh, we had terrible wars in Nigeria of conflicting organizations, uh, conflicting people, and the people that managed to keep the flame burning, to respect the cultures in such a difficult country is uh, something to be proud of, that they are part of a global heritage movement, that they're prepared to be advocates, to be there in such difficult circumstances and fight for the retention of their culture. But a perfect example is Uganda. Uh, Uganda, uh, that is not the next slide, but Uganda is where we have our international uh, conference every two years. We gather together and uh, Uganda is based on a number of kingdoms and the oldest kingdom in Uganda was the, king the kingdom of Uganda. And Uganda had I'm not sure how I can actually stop this moving. <laughs> uh, the, the Bugandan kings had a thousand year old site of their palaces and their tombs. And it was fascinating in the structure in that it was made out of totally ephemeral material. Weaving, uh, thatching, wood, but nevertheless, it was a giant structure which had a relationship with the Bugandan people. And two and a half years ago, there was a raid over the border. They came down from Rwanda where uh, one of the insurgent groups had departed Uganda and taken refuge over the border. And what did they do? That they headed straight to this ancient site, which is the only site in that part of Africa on the World Heritage List. And they torched it, burned it to the ground. And this was, as I say, like driving a stake into the heart of the nationalism, the pride of the Ugandan people. And it reinforced to me that this concept of holding dear and wanting to protect things that you hold dear is so uniform across all peoples that it is a uniting factor. And if we can come to respect each other's cultures, and although we've tried very different paths and very different countries, but that uniting respect for each other's cultures is an element of such importance if you have any message of humanity about them. And so I see the work of the international national trusts as effectively being a human rights issue. That we're effectively reinforcing people's human rights to value the things that they love and hold to. This is one of the National Trust properties, Barwon Park down on Winchelsea. Uh, it was where the, uh, the Austin family, they built that, that was their original homestead, and they released the rabbit. The, uh, the rabbit and the head of the fox were all released at Barwon Park. And um, it's not rem uh, remembered quite so fondly for those reasons. But it is part of the social history. I think that's
Austin Hospital, she said. Austin Hospital, that's correct. So, um, same family. So, but in each case, here we are at the Yeldon Trust for one of the castles, reenacting ancient uh, historic events, bringing places <coughs> alive. It's not just about bricks and mortar. This is another uh, Australian. These are the uh, portable houses. There, there are three of them down in South Melbourne, owned by the Victorian National Trust. Uh, they are prefabricated, brought out from sailing ships at the time of the gold rush. And uh, the Coventry Street houses, as they call them, can be visited down in South Melbourne. But each tells a story. Uh, Jamaica. It's sometimes very difficult with some countries to tell the whole story. Uh, with, with Jamaica, for instance, uh, a very uh, a big part of their history was a cruel history of the slave trade, of, of plantation life, uh, and of uh, warring factions amongst the uh, European colonial forces. And then in the, when uh, independence comes forth, then often the political instability still results in factions, faction fighting. And uh, I never cease to be amazed at how some of these national trusts can continue to maintain and fight for the retention of places that the whole of the so, India, intact. <coughs> India has the most remarkable heritage. The Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, which is one trust, uh, has uh, 150 chapters across the, the subcontinent. Uh, they involve, in a hands-on fashion, tens of thousands of people every day of the year in restoration of special places. And so uh, it's not uncommon to visit uh, a, a treasured place and to find that all the people there, uh, there will be some who have had tertiary qualifications in conservation management, and others will be students, local villagers, trained up to add to the force of people achieving what we need to achieve to save these magnificent places. And in many ways, every means is found <coughs> to enlist the largest population in a country like India. So here we have students being awarded uh, certificates for their involvement and work in heritage conservation. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, a country that seems to be at the brunt of just about <coughs> every uh, phenomenon of, of bad uh, climatic conditions of floods and drought and famine, whatever it might be, uh, but the Bangladeshis uh, still maintain a willingness to safeguard what is of value to them. Uh, Taiwan, an interesting story here. Uh, the Taiwan Environmental Association, there are two national trusts. Uh, that scene there is taking Oliver Morris, our uh, director of uh, membership services and advocacy, out into a bay in beyond a mangrove area. And that mangrove, uh, in, it's an embayment of mangroves growing in, is the only breeding place in the world for the pink dolphin, as pink as some of the flowers on the table. It's a unique genetic offshoot of uh, that species of animal. And uh, three years ago, uh, there was a proposal to build a very large petrochemical work and associated port <coughs> over the mangrove and effectively destroying the, uh, the breeding grounds of the pink uh, dolphin. And they were getting nowhere in Taiwan. So what they did, they, they approached into my organization and they said, uh, could we express a view on behalf of the international community of national trusts? <laughs> so I uh, signed a letter to the president of Taiwan and the happy result was is that they withdrew the project and moved it to another location. And to this day, they then created a uh, offshore reserve national park uh, to safeguard the pink dolphin. So it just was a confirmation to me how many nations will respond to the international glare of an organisation uh, such as my own. 
National Trust for Scotland, for Scotland, one of the oldest national trusts, mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful national trust with mm -hmm. beautiful properties. Oddly enough, struggling financially, uh, they have not succeeded to the extent that the English National Trust has in attracting the same uh, visitor support. <coughs> for those who don't know, just to give you an indication of the scale, the English National Trust has four million plus members. <coughs> It has an annual turnover of half a billion dollars and it has a staff approaching 20,000 people. <coughs> uh, they are, of course, the largest national trust. They're poor cousin over the Scottish border, uh, unfortunately, is in the process of uh, massively reducing staff, uh, selling a few properties, and trying to organise itself to survive in the future. Um, the footpath project is an interesting one. In, in, uh, the, the van there shows the logo of the English National Trust. A collaborative exercise was carried out in France. The National Trust in France is called Rempart. It's a foundation. Uh, and they use about 20,000 young volunteers to do hands-on heritage restoration projects throughout France. In fact, they now have a international remit and are doing good works in many different countries. But one of the projects that they adopted, and they called on fellow trusts from other places, was to construct <coughs> footpaths across the countryside in France, uh, often restoring ancient Roman paths, a uh, uh, very uh, historic uh, ways uh, by which people could uh, recreate the history by walking the paths that people had walked for centuries, and then in a physical and intellectual way, uh, then embrace the heritage we represented. Malta, one of the most fascinating <coughs> places in Europe. Uh, the National Trust of Malta uh, is almost, well, in fact, the whole of Malta is a World Heritage site, and the Crusader history and the, uh, the every successive generation of Malta has, has made its mark on the planet. And if you ever have a chance to visit Malta, uh, they have a, a wonderful national trust. Shall I just give a slight ad here, by the way? Uh, we are all linked, all the national trusts. So if you join the national trust in one country, it basically gives you an entree to any other national trust <coughs> for the same price. Uh, Slovakia, we've already talked about the project in Bratislava. Uh, Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is a, a, a national trust that blends a respect of the heritage of uh, its colonial years and its uh, traditional peoples. And uh, it, it again is a, uh, a trust that is at the crossroads of uniting different peoples, <coughs> and that can be an issue in going forward. But we're finding that that shared concept of heritage respect uh, is actually uh, a part of the rest of part of the formula of, in fact, stabilizing countries and nations to go forward. And the concept of heritage laws and policies is actually a very sound one in bringing stability to, to many, many nations. I put that there um, as a photograph of a European <coughs> uh, <coughs> tribesman uh, into uh, my organization plays a very big role in the climate change debates. Uh, we have witnessed in all our member countries the effects of climate change. Uh, in some cases, such as in, in, in Jordan with the Petra National Trust, the crumbling of the, the ancient monuments that are carved in the uh, Throughout Africa, we have seen you know, the, the great monuments of Zimbabwe disintegrating because of the variations in temperature and the withdrawal of moisture. And wherever you are, uh, we are finding that the impacts on the Great Gardens, for instance, uh, is rather dramatic. And with traditional people, so it's it's even uh, more dramatic. Uh, I heard this this uh, tribesman from Peru as part of a session in Copenhagen, chaired by Mary Robinson from Ireland, and he was talking about the fact that their whole culture is tied to an awareness <coughs> of climate and season. 
And as a consequence of that, song, storytelling, the building of structures, the writing of, of, the, of their literature, everything is tied to a relationship to the physical environment. And he said that increasingly over the last many years, uh, they do not recognize the seasons. They do not know when to sow the seed. It's a completely changed world. And the messages that one obtained from people such as that Peruvian tribesman reinforced to into that the most endangering process for us as people who care about cultural heritage is in fact climate change. And uh, in effect, we then found that if you didn't talk about cultural heritage as part of the climate change debates, uh, you then were removing a whole part of the debate that should be uh, considered, especially in considering the future. How do you manage uh, our physical world for the future if it is going to be radically changed? So we've been to every one of the UN conferences since Copenhagen, and uh, we have been expressing a view on behalf of the movement. But can I close by saying that uh, one of the great challenges for uh, us as a movement is to find the resources to do the, what we do. Uh, we are convening our next international congress in uh, Entebbe in Uganda in September. And what we have set as a uh, practice is to bring to each one of the international gatherings representatives from the developing countries. We took over 100 to New Delhi in 2007. We took 80 to Dublin in 2009. And we, we raised funds from the International Foundation. So the Getty Foundation has been a wonderful supporter in providing us <coughs> in taking people from uh, the, what you might call the underprivileged world to these forums so that they can mix with people to gain a better understanding of the know how, the, the way by which we can safeguard our heritage. And it's been very, very difficult. Uh, the GFC struck us almost uh, within a year or so of establishing INTO. And uh, well, I founded uh, four years ago the INTO International Heritage Foundation, a charity registered in the UK. And it's been very, very difficult uh, to raise funds. Sadly, one of the difficulties has been that um, in tough times, people start to look to themselves more often. And my, and this is, you know, I, it, it's totally understandable that people say, well, we must, um, what's that phrase, charity begins at home. Uh, but in one sense, it runs counter to the philosophy that I've actually been addressing, that we all are citizens of human, the whole of humanity, that we all have a shared obligation to cherish these special places that you've just seen a few snapshots of tonight. Um, I face a situation in this country where the um, National Trust here has, has decided that they can't support into uh, with tax deductible donations because it might take uh, funding away from the Australian Trust. But the Australian Trust are finding it difficult. And I can understand a decision like that. But it does keep coming up in my mind that if we all link together and shared views and shared philosophies and work together, we might actually do a better job rather than building barriers and, and saying, look, we'll get our, uh, ourselves right and we won't care about those on the other side of the border. And I suppose that's the message that I would like to leave with you all. You are an international organisation. You are a graduate house of people who are graduates of effectively intellectual learning gained universally. And part of that intellectual learning gained university is the experience we can derive from places in all parts of the world and the practices of all people. And we, I think, all need to learn a message and I'm sure there's no one in this room that would doubt it. But out there, there are many that if we can actually respect each other's cultures, work for the sustaining of those cultures, we will make this place, this world, a better place to live in for the future. 
and have something to be proud of, to take on to the people that follow us, to take on into the future for our future generations. So that's why we do it. That's why the International National Trust Organization is here. And we will fight on in whatever part of the world we're invited to do so. So thank you very much. with your organisation, I'm almost enticed to join it. However, I really love to um, know your policy and views on country A stealing the cultural heritage of country B and not returning back that which is the <coughs> inheritance of the original country without naming anything. <laughs> Well, um, I would be dishonest if I didn't say that clearly uh, heritage that comes from one country, the first claim on that heritage is that country. And so if the Elgin marbles have been moved to the British Museum, then if the Greeks would like them returned, then uh, that is where they should go. Right. Now, many years ago, an international convention was signed, in fact, by the majority of the nations of the world. And it required each country to establish a, uh, an advisory committee to advise their governments on the protection of what's called movable cultural heritage. And we have a piece of act, uh, we're sorry, we have a piece of legislation here called the Movable Culture Heritage. And there's an advisory committee under that. I happen to have sat on that committee for 14 years. Uh, I retired a couple of years ago as the longest standing member of it. And our role was to police the trafficking of cultural objects. And a number of the ceremonies that we organised course of those 14 years was the what's called the repatriation of <laughs> heritage that has been removed from one place and is, has been requested to go back. And uh, for instance, one of the most valuable collections of the dinosaurs, uh, bones and <coughs> eggs, uh, which had been uh, sold from China, uh, had been on the black market here in Australia. Uh, to be sold, and they were identified, they were seized, and then there was a handing back to China in a fairly public way to make the point that these precious Chinese objects should not be here. But it's highly controversial. It, there is absolutely no doubt that it's a highly controversial thing. Because the other side of the debate is that uh, we all learn from the uh, the objects that are in museums and galleries around the world. And uh, the way, uh, the concept, I was at the Pitch Rivers uh, Museum in Oxford uh, about three weeks ago, and that's one of the most controversial ones because uh, Pitch Rivers was a great collector and his mode of collecting was very controversial around the world. And he built up the, one of the finest anthropological collections that the world has, has ever seen. But uh, the issue is whether, in fact, such a museum should remain intact with its collection or whether they should start to be dispersed. Uh, I take the view that if there is a, a serious request from a country to return such an object, it should be very carefully considered and the international protocol should apply to ensure that when it goes back, it's not destroyed, it remains part of the intellectual property of the globe. Uh, but uh, I think that we always, citizens of the world, have to be aware that they should uh, own first, be first owned by the people they came from. Yes? Given the staggering cost uh, of all this, and I've just come from uh, uh, on $40 million that has been spent so far on Frank Lloyd Wright residence, 
Uh, do you have any suggestions for how uh, a country, a nation, can reward, say, the nation's farmers uh, to conserve the landscape and also ensure that government-owned natural resources are adequately uh, treated for vermin, noxious weeds and other pests? In other words, maintenance. Yeah. Um, <coughs> We could almost have a seminar. <laughs> Look, there is absolutely no doubt that there are a range of methods by which one can uh, assist land owners. Uh, in the current day, uh, shared ownership, shared management responsibilities are ways by which we can better look after landscaped areas. Uh, Rempart, the example that I referred to in France, does not restrict itself to publicly owned places. Uh, they have an attitude that wherever the historic landscape is, they're based in the Historic Landscape Organisation in France, they will take their volunteers into those places and they will help the landowners to achieve the objectives that we're talking about. It is true that at the interface in this country of public and private ownership of land and at the boundary of national parks and the like, one hears regular criticisms of, of uh, a lack of vermin control, control on one side of the fence compared to the control that might be imposed or uh, applied on the other. And my own view is, is that it's, we're never going to stop having to be vigilant finding the best way to do it. At the moment, I think that we, we are slipping. Uh, I think in Australia, we're seeing a wind back of focus on environmental planning and heritage policies that if they had continued to develop, we would find better economic instruments to achieve the outcomes. Uh, you refer specifically to land management uh, and to vermin control. Uh, with the prospects of carbon sequestration, I can never pronounce that word, as part of the uh, climate change response, there are opportunities by which farmers can actually uh, make uh, an income out of caring for the retention of natural vegetation or the revegetation re of such places. Uh, I'm a fifth generation pastoralist. Uh, my wife and I run pastoral enterprise in the far western division of New South Wales. Uh, we, uh, I'm going up to Golden Hill tomorrow to travel off my property and we have uh, just completed today uh, the fencing of a 100 acre uh, reserve that we are in partnership creating to protect an endangered species of eucalyptus, eucalyptus gilei. Uh, we happen to be the only property with two copses left, 20 trees in one, 30 trees in the other. We approached the government of New South Wales and said, look, we've identified this rare endangered tree. It's been eaten by goats the whole time, feral goats. We can't control it. Uh, will you partner with us to find a means to make it easier for us to look after this tree? The end result is we've now uh, put on our title a reserve of perpetuity that will protect this tree. We've had some assistance, dollar for dollar, and we've done it. Now, I simply measure, mention that because it's an example of an economic method of assisting farmers to bring about a positive conservation outcome for the future in relation to a biological species that is endangered and on the verge of extinction. So, have heart is what I can say. Uh, I am constantly frustrated at the occasional winding back of positive ideas and initiatives and policies. We are seeing, almost globally, but particularly in Australia, and particularly in some states over in other states, uh, a stepping back from a point where we had reached Populate reached where we were 
my view, on the brink of sustainable management of many areas of our Australian environment. Uh, I think in the next five years, uh, we will see uh, a move back probably 20 years of policy in that field. Mm -hmm. And I'm not being quite, uh, I'm not being political in saying that. It's a, my, my criticism is across all political parties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do we have one more question? Yes. yes. How does Stephen go about managing a, a potential conflict where there's, there's perhaps um, the cultural influence that I have coming from uh, a European, British uh, background with um, Indigenous groups who uh, perhaps don't like what is being considered when they're not being helped? And I, the only other country I could think of would be America, but they're <clears throat> Let me answer that this way. Uh, yes, it is often a great tension. And in fact, there's probably no country that I have visited that there is not a tension between the different ethnic groups or waves of migration, however one might like to identify. And my hope is, and I can say this in a graduate house filled with intellectual people who have uh, focused on problems of the world and whatever the discipline you are, there is an intellectual answer and an intellectual response. And I hope that as humankind becomes more sophisticated and more embracing of the global community, uh, the more likely it is that we'll be able to remove the uh, divisions that you refer to. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I think Kingsley probably heard Twinkie <coughs> Davis. Uh, when the National Trust in Victoria many years ago celebrated its uh, 40th uh, anniversary of its foundation, I delivered a speech at a ceremony at Wilson Hall, in fact, because the National Trust was in fact uh, set up with a close relationship with Melbourne University. And I had just come back that year <coughs> from conference in the U.S. visiting our colleagues, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is the U.S. National Trust. And it was held in Boston. And the conference was an extraordinary one, 6,000 people. Uh, it brought all the heritage societies and organizations from the whole of the U.S. together, and a, a few international guests, such as me. And there was a ceremony. The ceremony was in Boston Cathedral, and it was probably one of the most moving occasions I've ever had the honour and the pleasure to witness. And if I can just draw a picture in your mind of that ceremony, <clears throat> there was standing room only in the cathedral. It's one of the largest cathedrals in the US. It was packed to the rafters. And up at the front of the cathedral, they had uh, set in the centre place a large table on which there was a large book or chart, I'm not quite sure what I'd call it, I'll call it parchment, probably more fitting for the ceremony. And on this side <coughs> of the front of the cathedral were the heads of all the heritage organizations representing everyone that had come to America. So the traditional European and, and Asian and African people who had not been traditionally there going back a few centuries. And they were all there in their robes of office, whatever they might be. Chancellors of universities were in their robes. It was a, a massive thing. And on this side, on the other side, there was uh, two rows of the representatives, the chiefs, the high chiefs of, as they call, the First Nations of the U.S. In their full regalia, I thought I'd only ever seen them in film or in museums, but they were all totally ceremonially dressed. And it was a time of Vice President Gore, who was the official representative of the U.S. government, so he, was, he gave a very stirring speech about the, the fact that a nation like America 
is made stronger by the unity of purpose and vision with respect to the cultures that make up that, that nation. And then the, there were speeches from various similar people, uh, positions as the Vice President, and there was a great there was a choral interlude. And then there was a, a trumpeting and then an Indian music from the back drumming and <coughs> traditional Indian song. And then one by one, what happened was that the two rows that I could see at the front rose, and then they had actually, I had a notice that down the side there were literally dozens more people in there. And they all went down and came up the central aisle of the cathedral, and together, say, a European heritage representative and a high chief of one of the First Nations, and they approached the central dais and they signed on behalf of their respective ethnic background in their community, a pledge that they would work together to respect each other's culture. <coughs> now, I told that at that ceremony at Melbourne University. <coughs> and I said, it's my dream that one day this nation might have the same maturity, the same sophistication to be able to do something similar. Because I had that same year experienced uh, a fairly, I've always used the word aggressive, uh, rejection from representatives of certain Aboriginal groups in this country. Uh, when we said, look, we, the National Trust of Victoria, own Ebenezer Mission in the far west of Victoria, and we would like to uh, embrace Aboriginal culture as part of the National Trust movement. Now, um, at that stage, we hadn't reached the maturity. On one side, and my members were questioning. On the other side, there was still great hurt amongst the Aboriginal community, and so it didn't go ahead. There is a year since then, and that is that I do note that my successors last year uh, signed a reconciliation reconciliation uh, agreement with representatives of the uh, Aboriginal peoples in Victoria, as the National Trust in Victoria. So I think my message is that we can't expect it to happen overnight. And we will all be at different stages in one, one part of the world to another. But we should at least have faith that we've got the intellectual capacity and the emotional commitment to be able to <clears throat> embrace the values of each other's cultures and go forward. And perhaps as a footnote, I'm sorry, there's been a terribly long answer, I do apologise for it. Uh, <coughs> being launched in Dubrovnik in Croatia, a horribly war-torn country, a most recent war, where in inexplicably supposedly sophisticated cultured European for each other's throat. Uh, very recent memory. But we do have it in Dubrovnik, in Croatia, in August, where being launched is a far larger unity in the cultural field than my organisation meant to. I will be there at the launch of an organisation, a movement called the Global Heritage Forum, which is, in one sense, people have said, to balance the Global Heritage, the Economic Forum it occurs at Dravos. Because what we are announcing is that on an annual basis in Dubrovnik, the symbolism of Dubrovnik is delivered we will convene a Global Heritage Forum every year in August. So, sorry, September, September. And uh, the heads of all the cultural organisations worldwide that have a, a beyond national remit have been invited to participate. Uh, I will be, uh, I've got the honour of, of uh, delivering the keynote opening address and then going on, I will be convening the Global Heritage Forum. And 
we believe we will basically create a global voice. <coughs> People who are in museums and galleries and archives, national trusts and heritage foundations the world over to share a view that cultural heritage is a factor of unity going forward. And if we all focus on the opportunities of cultural heritage being a unifying factor, well, this world will be a better place. Thank you.